The slogan for the High Commissioner ever since 1992 has been integration with respect for diversity. It is a useful guideline for a sustainable society and may also be valid in addressing the challenges related to refugees and asylum seekers. Their identity should be respected in the same way as we respect the culture and religion of our traditional national minorities. However, it also means that minorities will have to accept that they are minorities and should seek to understand the history, culture, traditions and religion or lack of religion of the societies to which they come. With the number of refugees and asylum seekers that many European countries have received, there is no doubt that national and local authorities will have problems meeting their obligations according to international law and standards, even if they want to. And we have heard a lot about that uh, earlier today. In addition, which we also have heard, we see a shift in the attitude among many politicians. The pictures of drowned children on the shores of Europe have been replaced by images of young men looking for the good fortune in Europe. This has produced a very negative rhetoric where closing borders, restricting access, and returning so-called non-worthy refugees has become the new mantra, instead of addressing the many challenges related to integration. If we allow this rhetoric to continue, integration will be even harder to achieve because the negative attitude with which we meet the refugees will resonate in the wider population. This does not mean that we should be naive. There has to be control. A naive attitude will backlash and undermine people's trust in the authorities' capacity and capability to handle the challenges. That will have serious consequences and move people into the hands of nationalists and populists. Let me try to be practical, and I have ten points. Firstly, representatives of churches and civil society should study the Geneva Convention on Refugees. I suppose you've already done that many times, but uh, do it again. And find out what are the obligations of the receiving state. In view of the massive influx of refugees, more and more countries take legal and practical measures to limit the rights of refugees, as we also have heard. And we have also heard that there are initiatives to rewrite the Geneva Convention, and I can tell you that that's even happening in Norway. Those who make such proposals do not understand that the result could be no international rules and regulations at all. Civil society must defend the existing international instruments, protocols, and obligations, and demand that they are fully respected. Secondly, the legal rights of refugees have to be addressed. In some countries, authorities are sending refugees, as you also have heard, back without proper handling of their applications for asylum. This will in most cases be a violation of the receiving state's obligations. Who represents the refugees in these legal matters? There should be a demand for identifying an ombud or establishing an institution responsible for this. Thirdly, as soon as people after arriving uh, the as soon as possible after arriving, the refugees should be given information about the country and culture where they now live. This is of fundamental importance both to avoid incidents like those seen in Cologne and Stockholm, but also to facilitate long-term integration. Providing such information is an obligation of the authorities. However, with the great influx of refugees, authorities might not have the capacity to do so, and civil society should offer its help and services. Fourthly, language courses should be started immediately. All experience shows that language proficiency is the most important factor in any integration process. In some countries, language courses are only offered after the asylum seekers have been granted refugee status or residence permits. The argument being that the asylum seekers should not be given false hopes, nor should there be created too strong strings to the community where they happen to have their temporary shelter. This is unwise. <coughs> the process of deciding the status often takes long and valuable time is lost while frustration increases among the refugees who are unable to communicate with the local population. 
For asylum seekers in countries where the national language is not an international one, like in my own country, an option might be to start with English language training, for instance, or French or German or whatever you want, but a, a, a bigger language. In some countries, so-called language cafes have been established where local people help out both with education and conversation because this will facilitate, as I see the integration process, as common complaint is that asylum seekers have nobody to speak with. Fifthly, find out about the religious affiliation of the asylum seekers and try to connect them with appropriate local religious groups. Often authorities in a secular European country have little understanding, or none, of the importance of religion in people's lives. Civil society, churches, and other religious communities may offer their assistance. This can be a useful tool in bridging gaps and facilitating integration. Sixthly, let the refugees do their chores themselves, preparing food, cleaning, etc. As we have heard and seen, in most cases, the shelters are probably substandard, and one should look into the conditions to improve them. However, because of the crisis, in Norway, we have started using hotels to accommodate the, the, the refugee um, uh, or the asylum seekers. And I'm not against that. But we have recently had a case where the asylum seekers were relocated from the initial place, namely a hotel, where they were treated like hotel guests. And they, were, they basically refused to move into a more simple shelter. This creates unnecessary conflicts and give bad publicity to the asylum seekers. Seventhly, get to know the persons that have come and inform about their stories. Personal relationships and friendships are important. The Norwegian Red Cross has established what they call refugee guides, where they match Norwegians with refugees. Congregations and other groups may also invite refugees to their gatherings in order for the refugees to tell their stories if they so want. The great influx has made refugees into mere numbers. It would help the understanding and acceptance of the newcomers if we can see them as individuals and learn about their reasons for fleeing as well as their life before fleeing. I may be a refugee. But that is not my profession, nor my entire life. Getting to know the refugees and their background will facilitate their integration. Eighthly, try to find employment for the adult refugees. Again, we see an unfortunate trend in keeping the asylum seekers idle for months and years, partly because their status is unclear or because they do not speak the local language or out of sheer discrimination. This is detrimental to any integration efforts. Again, churches and civil society might be able to step in. Ninthly, education is fundamental for long-term success in integration. Adults may need better and more relevant education to be able to find employment. Even more important is education for children. Children's education should have highest priority and should not wait till formal refugee status has been granted. This is also an area for civil society to monitor and help out. And finally, make sure that violations of national laws are not covered up. If churches and civil society do not address legal violations and crime carried out by asylum seekers, they play into the hands of nationalistic and populistic group, groups that will gain strength and sympathy and be detrimental to the long-term integration. To conclude, let me stress that we should avoid an overly altruistic rhetoric. No doubt we have a moral obligation to help people in need. However, addressing the refugee crisis is as much an act of self-interest. At this time, we already have a great number of refugees and asylum seekers in our countries. Let us therefore avoid a futile discussion about pros and cons of a multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-religious society. Our societies are multi. Therefore, we have to discuss how to make this multifaceted society viable, as good as possible, for as many as possible. Thank you.